2023 brought a slew of highly anticipated trials. Uh, have you reached a verdict? Yes, yes, sir, we have. Is it unanimous? Yes, sir, it is. So have a good life, sh business. Surprising testimony. I said I can still watch my children ski and be skied directly into my back by someone. And some courtroom shockers. State of Florida versus Travis Rudolph. Defendant, verdict. We, the jury, find as follows. As to count one, we find the defendant not guilty. We're recapping some of the year's top verdicts, beginning in the South Carolina Low Country for the trial of Alec Murdoch. The state versus Richard Alexander Murdoch, defendant. Indictment for murder, SC code 16-3-0010, CDR code 0116, guilty verdict. The disgraced former attorney now convicted killer is serving two life sentences for the murders of his wife Maggie and youngest son Paul. This has been perhaps one of the most troubling cases, not just for me as a judge, uh, for the state, for the defense team, but for all of the citizens in this community, all the citizens in this state, and as we've seen based on the media coverage there throughout the nation, uh, you have a wife who's been killed, murdered, a son savage, savage, savagely murdered. A lawyer, a person from a respected family who has controlled justice in this community for over a century. A person whose grandfather's portrait hang at the back of the courthouse that I had to have ordered removed in order to ensure that a fair trial was had by both the state and the defense. Alec Murdoch was indicted by a grand jury for killing Maggie and Paul in July of 2022, more than a year after Murdoch says he discovered their bodies outside the family's dog kennels on their Moselle property. Over the course of Murdoch's trial, the state called several witnesses to the stand, from law enforcement to Murdoch's former co-workers and friends, as well as longtime employees for the Murdoch family who knew the family behind closed doors. Once the case turned over to the defense, in a shocking move, Alec Murdoch himself took the stand for three straight days. On June 7th, 2021, did you take this gun or any gun like it and shoot your son Paul in the chest in the feed room at your property off Moselle Road? No, I did not. Mr. Murdoch, did you take this gun or any gun like it and blow your son's brains out? on June 7th, or any day, or any time? No, I did not. Mr. Murray, did you take a 300 blackout such as this and fire it into your wife Maggie's leg, torso, or any part of her body? No, I did not. Did you shoot a 300 blackout into her head, causing her death. Mr. Griffin, I didn't shoot my wife or my son any time, ever. Mr. Murdoch, is that you? On the kennel video at 8.44 p.m. on June 7th, the night Maddie, Maggie and Paul were murdered. It is. Were you in fact at the kennels at 8.44 p.m. on the night Maggie and Paul were murdered? I was. Did you lie to Sled Agent Owen and Deputy Laura Rutland on the night of June 7th and told them that you stayed at the house after dinner? I did lie to them. Did you lie to Agent Owen and Agent Croft on the follow-up interview on June 10th that the last time you saw Maggie and Paul was at dinner? I did lie to them. And in the interview of August 11th, did you tell Agent Owen and Agent Croft did you lie to them t by telling them that you were not down at the kennels on that night? Yes. 
Alec, why did you lie to Agent Owen, Agent Croft, and Deputy Rutland about the last time you saw Maggie and Paul? As my addiction evolved over time, I would get in these situations or circumstances where I would get paranoid thinking. Uh, it, and it, it could be anything that, that triggered it. It might be a look somebody gave me. It might be a reaction somebody had to something I did. Um, it might be a policeman following me in, in a car. Um, that night, June 7th, after finding Mags and Paul, 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 don't talk to anybody without Danny with you. All my partners were just repeatedly telling me that. I had a deputy sheriff taking gunshot test from my hands. I'm sitting in a police car with David Owen asking me about my relationship with my wife and my son. And all those things coupled together after finding them, coupled with my distrust for SLED caused me to have paranoid thoughts. Normally, when these paranoid thoughts would hit me, I could take a deep breath real quick and just think about it, reason my way through it, and just get past it really quickly. On June the 7th, I wasn't thinking clearly. I don't think I was capable of reason. And I lied about being down there. And I'm so sorry that I did. I'm sorry to my son Buster. I'm sorry to Grandma and Papa T. I'm sorry to both of our families. Most of all, I'm sorry to Mags and Paul Paul. I would never intentionally do anything to hurt either one of them. Ever. Ever. Did you continue lying after that night? Did you not? But once I lied, I continued to lie, yes, sir. Why? You know, oh, what a tangled web we weave. But once I told a lie, I mean, I told my family, I, I had to keep lying. However, his words did not sway the jurors. Uh, have you reached a verdict? Yes, yes, sir, we have. Is it unanimous? Yes, sir, it is. The state versus Richard Alexander Murdoch defendant, indictment for murder, SC code 16-3-0010, CDR code 0116. Guilty verdict. Signed by the four lady, three, two, twenty three. Docket number two thousand twenty two dash GS dash fifteen dash zero zero five nine three. The state of South Carolina, County of Colleton, in the Court of General Sessions, the July term of two thousand twenty two. The state versus Richard Alexander Murdoch, defendant, indictment for murder. SC code 16-3-0010, CDR code 0116, verdict guilty, signed by the four lady. And during Murdoch's sentencing, Judge Clifton Newman had harsh words for the man who used to try cases in the very courtroom where he faced sentencing. It's also particularly troubling, uh, Mr. Murdoch, because... <laughs> As a member of the legal community and a well-known member of the legal community, uh, you've practiced law before me 
and we've seen each other at various occasions throughout the years. And it was especially heartbreaking for me to see you um, go on, go in the media from being a, a grieving father who lost a wife and a son to being the person indicted and convicted of killing them. And you've engaged in such duplicitous conduct uh, here in the courtroom, here on the witness stand, and as established by the testimony throughout the time leading from the time of the indictment and prior to the indictment throughout the trial to this moment in time. Uh, certainly, you uh, have no obligation to say anything other than saying not guilty. <clears throat> and obviously, as appeals are probably expected or absolutely expected, I would not uh, expect a confession of any kind. In fact, as I've presided over murder cases over the past 22 years, I have yet to find a defendant who could go there, who could go back to that moment in time when they decided to pull the trigger or to otherwise murder someone. I have not been able to get anyone, any defendant, even those who have confessed to being guilty, to go back and explain to me what happened at that moment in time when they opted to pull the trigger, when they opted to commit the most heinous crime known to man. Murdoch is currently serving his life sentence in a maximum security prison in South Carolina. Next, we head to South Florida for the trial of three men who are spending the rest of their life behind bars for robbing and fatally shooting a rising star on the rap scene. In the circuit court of the 17th Judicial Circuit in Fort Broward County, Florida, the state of Florida versus Dieter Williams, verdict count one. We, the jury, find as follows as to the defendant, Dieter Williams, in this case, the defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree as charged in the indictment. Count two, we the jury find as follows as to the defendant, Dedrick Williams, in this case, the defendant is guilty of armed robbery as charged in the indictment. Count one, we the jury find as follows as to the defendant, Michael Boatwright, in this case, the defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree as charged in the indictment. During the course of the crime committed, did the defendant, Michael Boatwright, actually possess a firearm? Yes. During the course of the crime committed, did the defendant, Michael Boatwright, actually discharge a firearm? Yes. During the course of the crime committed, did the defendant, Michael Boatwright, actually inflict death to Jose Anfroy as a result of discharging a firearm in his possession? Yes. Count two. We, the jury, find as follows as to the defendant, Michael Boatwright, in this case, the defendant is guilty of armed robbery as charged in the indictment. During the course of the crime committed, did the defendant, Michael Boatwright, actually possess a firearm? Yes. During the course of the crime committed, did the defendant, Michael Boatwright, actually discharge a firearm? Yes. During the course of the crime committed, did the defendant, Michael Boatwright, actually inflict death to Jose Anfroy as a a result of discharging a firearm in his possession? Yes. Verdict, count one. We, the jury, find as follows as to the defendant, Trayvon Newsom, in this case. The defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree as charged in the indictment. 
during the course of the crime committed, did the defendant, Trayvon Newsom, actually possess a firearm? Yes. Count two, we the jury find as follows, as to the defendant, Trayvon Newsom, in this case, the defendant is guilty of armed robbery as charged in the indictment. During the course of the crime committed, did the defendant, Trayvon Newsom, actually possess a firearm? Yes. So say we all, this 20th day of March, 2023, at Fort Lauderdale, Broward County, Florida, signed by the four person. Dedrick Williams, Trayvon Newsom, and Michael Boatwright were each handed down a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of parole for gunning down rapper XXX Tentacion in 2018. The prosecution painted the trio's acts as calculated and deliberate. Going together to Reba Motorsports to purchase the mask, okay? They went in the Dodge Journey. That's another example. Inside the Dodge Journey, you'll recall, they had everything that they needed to rob and kill the victim. There were masks, there were firearms, they were ready to go, okay? And that's the way that they assisted each other, encouraged each other to help commit this crime. Another way, Williams and <coughs> Allen confirm that the victim is inside Reba Motorsports. Two of them remained inside the Dodge Journey, Trayvon Newsom and Michael Boatwright stayed inside the Dodge Journey while the other two go inside to the Reba Motorsports to confirm that the victim is there. That's another example of how the principle theory is applied because they're all assisting each other. Lying in wait for the victim together, waiting for the victim to exit Reba Motorsports. That's another example of how the law is applied to these facts. They planned and executed a coordinated attack on the victim. Think about it, when you, which we'll look at clips from the surveillance video, when you see the Dodge Journey very quickly cut the victim off, that's the first coordinated part. Second coordinated part, two of the gunmen quickly jump out in a blitz fashion, coordinate, go to each side of the car. That's another planned coordinated attack. That's assisting each other. And ask yourself this, would Dietrich Williams have been able to commit this homicide and armed robbery without Michael Boatwright and Trayvon Newsom? I don't think so. Would Michael Boatwright have been able to commit this homicide and armed robbery without Dietrich Williams and Trayvon Newsom? Would Trayvon Newsom have been able to commit this homicide and armed robbery without Dietrich Williams and Michael Boatwright? If you're able to answer each question as no, then you're applying the principal theory correctly. Because each of them, Dietrich Williams as a driver, he would not have been able to approach both sides of the car as an armed gunman. He needed them in order to commit this armed robbery and homicide. Michael Boatwright, needed his co-defendants to be able to rent the car, to be able to drive off. He couldn't have done that by himself. Trayvon Newsom, he's the other gunman. He needed a second gunman to approach the, the driver's side. He needed a driver to get away. He needed assistance to rent the car. These are all things where they're acting together as principles to one another. Before Judge Michael Usan handed down their sentences, the court heard victim impact statements from the Rising Stars manager and friend, on June 18th, as a family, we received the worst call a family can receive. A call that informed us that our loved one was taken from us. Taken is a passive way to put it, because our loved one, Jase Onfroy, was senselessly murdered. Jase was a son, he was a brother, he was a friend, a nephew, a father, and an artist. He was a beam of hope for all that knew him and all that knew his music. But Jase's life was not only robbed from us and his family, it was robbed of his extended family as well. His extended family of millions of people across the globe. And how ironic it is that someone who selflessly used his platform to save countless lives loses his for no good cause. A young man's life was cut short at the tender age of 20. A young man well into his journey of becoming a man and leaving the world in a better place than he found it. 
We sat through this entire trial without seeing the defendants display an ounce of remorse for taking Jose's life. Smiling at us, blowing kisses, waving, without even taking into consideration that you not only killed the son, but you killed the father. Due to the actions of these killers, Jose will never get to meet his son, yet alone raise him. Generations of our family were affected by this senseless killing. This is a loss we will never truly recover from. We will never get to see Jase live to his full potential. We will never get to watch him grow old. We will never get to watch him be a father. Jase was not spared in his final moments, and I hope the court finds it appropriate to not spare any of the lives of the defendants. We would like to thank Pascal and the entire prosecution team for their incredible work. We would like to thank the jury for their time and their compassion for our family. And we would like to thank the court for bringing us justice and some sort of closure. Thank you. As well as a statement. You murderers took not only a son, a father, a brother, a grandson, a great grandson, a grandnephew, a nephew, a cousin, and a friend. Jase was loved by his family and friends all over this world. And you guys murdered him and left a gaping hole in each person's heart. Each time I attended court and I looked over at you, especially you, Michael Boatwright, I saw you smirking and you showed no remorse. As a matter of fact, when my eyes wandered across the room to all of you guys' faces, you guys showed no empathy to the family you destroyed with your evil, callous deeds. We the family ask, why? Why killing? I prayed every time I see your faces or think about you, I prayed that each one of you would be given the death penalty for what you have done. I heard the death penalty is off the table. However, whatever time you've given and whichever hole you are sent, I hope it is hell and you rot there. And I would like to thank the court for actually giving us some type of justice. Thank you very much. Judge Michael Usan not mincing words for the three now convicted killers, even thanking the Sunshine State for imposing laws that would keep the killers behind bars for the rest of their lives. Mr. Newsom, you, sir, are a perfect example of why we have in this state a felony murder rule. I'm pretty sure having sat through the trial that you did not wake up that morning and say to yourself, I'm going to go kill somebody today or I'm going to go and hook up with people who will murder someone. But you did go for an armed robbery. And what happens is that when you take a firearm and you rob somebody, you're telling the world I'm going to take something that doesn't belong to me by force. And I've got deadly force. And I'm willing to use that deadly force and able to achieve my goals. And even if your intent at that moment was not was only to rob and not to kill, who can say that the death of the victim is not a predictable and foreseeable outcome of arming yourself and confronting the person? That's why we have the felony murder rule. You are a textbook case. It was you who picked the target in this case. You went inside Riva Motorsports to confirm the identification and what was there. And then you went back out and sat in the vehicle. Now, while you may not have left the vehicle and you may not have uh, uh, brandished a firearm or fired the fatal shots, you are as guilty as they are, because you are an essential part of that crime. Without your actions, it would not have happened. Additionally, 
I don't look at the way someone behaves in court. Courts, for sentencing purposes, courts are stressful things. People react to stuff differently. But there are things that I can look at. And I can tell you this court is shocked by your behavior after the murder. A person who had any measure of human decency or remorse for killing someone would not likely be seen dancing around and filming themselves with the stolen money, how proud you were of yourself. You should understand that while you were dancing on that bed, throwing down those bills, you weren't throwing money down on the floor. You should think of that as you tossing down the days, weeks, and months of your life just like that like so many pieces of paper. And the very next day when you went to spend that blood money on sneakers and jerseys, you revealed to the court the value you placed on the human life that was taken. Just a pair of sneakers to you. Mr. Boatwright. You turned a robbery into a murder. And on that day when you stood there and fired that weapon, you didn't just end one life. You effectively ended five lives, including your own. Like I just said, you, you need to understand that when we say life in Florida State Prison, that means life. It is necessarily without parole. Florida abolished parole. You know, as the song says, you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. You will spend the rest of your life in prison. From here, you will go and be placed in a cell that has a stainless steel slab that's attached to the wall. That's your bed. And next to it is a stainless steel sink and a stainless steel toilet. That's the furniture that you have in that cell. You'll spend every hour, and every day, and every week, and every year of your life in that cell. And one day, they'll come and open up that cell in the morning and you'll have passed on. And only on that day will you have served your sentence. All three are serving life sentences in the Florida Department of Corrections. Next, we head up north to Kenosha, Wisconsin for the trial of Zachariah Anderson. Anderson was convicted earlier this year for the 2020 killing of Rosalio Gutierrez Jr., whose body has never been found. Investigators say Anderson stalked his ex-girlfriend Sadie Beecham and Gutierrez for weeks because he was jealous of their relationship. Prior to Anderson's sentencing, the court heard from the woman at the center of the fatal love triangle, Anderson's ex-girlfriend Sadie. Life will never be the same for any of us, and I never would have imagined this would have been my life. I've endured some tough losses, deaths of both my parents and a beloved Grams, but no one could have prepared me for this kind of loss. Loss of dignity and self-esteem in a relationship that was manipulative and emotionally abusive, then coming to terms with having to grieve the loss of that relationship, losing the trust and respect 
of my one and only daughter, my baby girl, the one who made me a mom, due to the irresponsible, inconsiderate, and irreversible actions of her father to exploit her mother and create a narrative of shame to an impressionable 12-year-old girl. Loss of feeling safe and the safety of our children and the feelings of helplessness and fear with you around. Loss of a budding relationship and a friend who innocently and ultimately suffered the greatest loss, his life. A loss is greater than I could ever imagine, but we will continue to survive these losses and I will continue to choose love and kindness to move forward and to nurture and mother my children with. I will teach them all the good things about you and I cannot fix the damage you've done, but I can minimize the long-term effects and I intend to do that with love in my heart every day. You should have just waited for colder weather. As well as Anderson's daughter, who testified that her father asked her to spy on her mom before he killed her new lover. This is meant for dad. Um, so, no, I think. Thirteen letters was the beginning, not realizing that the next three years of my life would be taken from me and consumed with learning how to be my own person. Watching myself go into a really dark place was hard. Getting out and regaining my confidence was a whole new level of difficult. I never thought seven years ago this was the way me, my mom, and my dad's story ended. <laughs> It breaks my heart to this day knowing things will never be the same. The joy, the sadness, and the anger were all things I once had. And then the numbing happened. And that scared me because it gave me the loss of respect, even for myself. I started thinking and waking up to the fact that now I need to make a change in my life and not let the same abusive patterns continue. Little did I know, I was already trapped. Trapped in a mindset I couldn't free myself from. To this day, I wonder, did he ever love me? Or was I just a pawn, a toy, or his little golden retriever? You took me for granted, and you will never get the same respect back. If you don't believe me, ask mom. She doesn't have that respect either anymore. After this whole situation, I had to relearn how to not let what other people said get to me so much and retrain my mind to not have a mindset like my parents. I think you'd like to know it's beautiful outside. It's for sure frisbee weather and a bit windy. <laughs> so turbulence would catch it, <laughs> but we'd have fun. <laughs> Forever and always I miss you and I love you, but a quote from the 13 letters. <laughs> Do not come back and expect me to welcome you back in. With open arms, you need to work on yourself first. I've worked on myself for the past three years. It's your turn now, if you want your baby girl back. But it was the words of Celia Patterson, the mother of Rosalio Gutierrez, who made an impassioned speech, as she has now gone years without knowing where her son's body is. The emptiness, helpless despair I felt then, I feel today. That's 24, 7, 365. It will never cease. For this mother, incapable of moving on from losing her only child. What did he do with my son's body? Will Mr. Anderson ever tell me or tell this court? I beseech this court to consider all the lives forever altered from the actions of one man, Zachariah Joseph Anderson. Mr. Anderson made a conscious, calculated, and planned decisions, which led to the evening hours of Sunday, May 17, 2020. He chose to cowardly stalk my son, consumed with jealousy and hatred towards a man he did not even know, waiting for the right time, and savagely attacked and murdered him, then hid his heinous actions by removing and disposing my son's corpse not allowing my son a Christian burial, not allowing me a son to grieve over, nor a grave to visit. But Anderson couldn't help but use his last few words to the court to maintain his innocence. 
I don't want to go into all the details of the case. We got a lot of dispute about what was said, what was portrayed. I think the facts, with a little more scrutiny, tell a much different story than what the jury decided. And I don't think that that, uh, I don't think that things played out fairly. I think that there's some things that are not just from our side, questions outstanding for both sides. And I don't think the court accomplished what it set out to do in any means if both sides are left with so many questions. And I don't think uh, without going into the case, I don't think we really got to the heart of the matter. What I can tell you is I didn't kill anybody. What I can tell you is I didn't stalk anybody. And what I can tell you is I didn't dispose of any corpse. It's really weird to be sentenced for or convicted for it and soon to be sentenced for it, but I didn't judge. It kind of feels like there's no turning around on that now. I don't really know how to make a better statement of my opposition, but I disagree. I'm innocent. And if I killed somebody, whatever that situation was, I can tell you in my own heart it wouldn't be intentional. But if I didn't at all, a guy I never met, I don't really know, I don't really know what this is, but I didn't do it. I'm innocent, Judge. Not, not guilty. I'm innocent. Anderson was sentenced to life in prison. What you did was frightening, horrible. Uh, and you can wag your head all you want. The jury found beyond a reasonable doubt that you did it. And uh, so this, the, the loss of these people is beyond measure. But it is important that they realize that I have this litany of factors that I must consider and that what ultimately is the sentence that you receive is not the measure of the value of Mr. Gutierrez's life. Zachariah Anderson is currently serving out his life sentence with the Wisconsin Department of Corrections. Now we had a few counties over in Wisconsin for the trial of a woman who idolized Jeffrey Dahmer. The first verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant, Taylor Denise Shabusiness, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide as charged in count one of the information. Dated this date, July 26th, 2023, signed by the foreperson. Second verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant, Taylor Denise Shabusiness, guilty of mutilating a corpse as charged in count two of the information. Dated this date, July 26th, 2023, signed by the four person. The next verdict reads, we the jury find the defendant Taylor Denise Shabusiness guilty of third degree sexual assault as charged in count three of the information. Dated this date, 26th day of July, 2023, signed by the four person. Taylor Shabusiness was convicted in July for the gruesome and heinous 2022 killing and dismemberment of her former boyfriend, Chad Therion. Prosecutors said the two were smoking meth in Therion's mother's basement when Shabusiness strangled, decapitated, and dismembered his body, leaving parts of him scattered inside his mother's home and her friend's van. During her sentencing where she donned a spit mask, Therion's family didn't hold back their thoughts on Shabusiness's horrendous crime. So that name Taylor shit, uh, shit business fits you well. And I'm not a praying man, but after Judge Walsh here sentence you today, I will pray that you meet the same fate as your idolistic Jeffrey Dahmer. So have a good life, shit business. And in a stunning turn of events, Shat Therion's father offered words of compassion for his son's killer. Taylor, I just wanted to say that uh, I forgive you for what you've done to my son. And, uh, yeah, you made a bad choice, and now you have to live with it. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to miss Shad. He was, a, he was a wonderful child, too, he, growing up just mild-mannered and just happy. And, and uh, I know you made a bad choice, and... 
and uh, like I said, I forgive you, and and I'm going to ask the judge if he can, you know, if she can see the streets again sometime, you know. But Judge Thomas Walsh ruled he had a duty to protect the public, sending her to prison for life with no chance of parole. This crime offends human decency, it offends human dignity, and it offends the human community. It really does. When someone loses their life needlessly, it's tragic. It, it really is. Um, it's tragic for family and friends and community. Um, when life is taken by a, uh, from a person in the fashion that it was in this case, where the victim's remains are, are cut up and packaged in containers, it's difficult to identify a human nature in those activities. It, it really is. So the need to protect the public uh, is an important factor the court needs to, to struggle with as well. And in light of what I've just indicated, I think it's plain that there is a need to protect the public in this case. Um, as I said, this behavior seems so removed from the, from the uh, human community as to be unpredictable. It really is. Um, and in a place where, where this kind of a where this kind of an offense, kind of actions, kind of a crime is possible, uh, with no advanced warning signs, and um, absolutely anything's possible then. Where this kind of a thing is, is possible, absolutely anything is possible. And from that, the public needs protection. Shabiznis is serving her sentence with the Wisconsin Department of Corrections. We head out west for the trial of Colorado's stepmother, who was convicted of killing her 11-year-old stepson. With respect to count number one, charge of murder in the first degree after deliberation. We, the jury, find the defendant, Letitia Stauk, guilty of count number one, murder in the first degree after deliberation. With respect to count number two, charge of murder in the first degree, child under 12 by a person in a position of, tw of trust. We, the jury, find the defendant, Letitia Stauk, guilty of count number two, murder in the first degree, child under 12, position of trust. With respect to count number three, uh, charge of tampering with a deceased human body, we, the jury, find the defendant, Letitia Stauk, guilty of count number three, tampering with a deceased human body. With respect to count number four, <coughs> charge of tampering with physical evidence, we, the jury, find the defendant, Letitia Stauk, guilty of count number four, tampering with physical evidence. Letitia Stauk was found guilty of all charges against her for the horrific shooting death of her 11-year-old stepson, Gannon. Prosecutors said Letitia stabbed the 11-year-old more than a dozen times before hitting him in the head, shooting him, stuffing his body in a suitcase, then dumping it across the country under a bridge in Florida. Gannon's mother and his father, who was married to Letitia at the time of Gannon's murder, delivered emotional victim impact statements in court as they called on the judge to give Letitia no mercy for her crimes. You wanted to leave us with that, knowing it would torture us. But you underestimated me. I am Landon, Gannon's mom, and that will never change. Through my hurt, anger, and pain, I will never be the monster that she is. I can never be filled with the hate that her heart holds. I pray that we will never have to look at her face again, I will continue to hold on to my faith. Vengeance is not mine as I surely wish it could be at times, but it's the Lord's. I have to trust in that. And to the community for your countless hours. Tisha, that was her biggest mistake. You underestimated this community and this defensive team, Lorson Ranch. They searched for and fought for Gannon within hours, and they never believed your lies from the moment they started. None of these people ever gave up on him. You never looked. All of these people I will forever hold close to my heart. Always Gannon Strong, my gene men forever. Justice has been served today. I pray also that Tisha lives the fullest and happiest life that any inmate possibly can live. I also pray that every night before she falls asleep, her last breath before she drifts off sounds just like the breath that she describes Gannon breathing as life left his body. And that all through her sleep, she dreams of all the fun they had at Disney and other places we went throughout our time together. And that every morning as she is about to wake, the end of the, her dream, the last words Gannon spoke or screamed or cried, Tisha, stop. You're hurting me. Why, Tisha? Daddy, help me. 
I want my mommy. Why couldn't you let her just be a mama's boy? Judge Gregory Warner laid her through the proverbial book at Letitia, sending her to life behind bars. You have shown no remorse throughout this process. Instead, you've made a choice to build a web of lies. When you gave an interview to Detective Jessica Bethel on January 29 of 2020, you told her you lied to her about Gannon running away and that he was actually taken by a guy named Eduardo. When you explained that to Detective Bethel, you said you needed to lie because you didn't want to face the consequences. You told her that you were trying to come up with a plan about what you should do. And finally, you told her you really thought you could fix this. I think that's true. You lied because you didn't want to face the consequences. You needed to come up with a plan to fix this, and that plan involved covering up what you had done. It involved lie upon lie. But you slipped up at various points and let kernels of truth escape. Your conduct in this case deserves the maximum punishment that I can impose under Colorado law. As such, with respect to the charge of first-degree murder after deliberation, I remand you to the custody of the Colorado Department of Corrections for the remainder of your life with no possibility of parole. Next, we head to Idaho, where doomsday cult mom Lori Vallow Daybell was found guilty of murder for killing her two youngest children, Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, as well as conspiring to kill her husband, Chad's first wife, Tammy Daybell. Question number one. In regards to count one of the amended indictment, is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Tylee Ryan and grand theft by deception? Answer, guilty. Question number two. In regards to count two of the amended indictment, is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of first degree murder of Tylee Ryan? Answer, guilty. Question number three. In regards to count three of the amended indictment, is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Joshua Jackson Vallow and grand theft by deception? Answer, guilty. Question number four, in regards to count four, the amended indictment, is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of first degree murder of Joshua Jackson Vallow? Answer, guilty. Question number five, in regards to count five of the amended indictment, is Lori Noreen Vallow not guilty or guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Tamara Tammy Daybell? Answer, guilty. During Lori's sentencing, she went on a bizarre rant quoting Bible verses and denying that her children and Tammy had actually been murdered. I would like to start by quoting John from the New Testament in the Bible. In John chapter 8, verse 7, Jesus says, He that is without sin among you, let him cast first cast a stone at her. Then in first, verse 15, Jesus says, Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. Jesus knows me. And Jesus understands me. I mourn with all of you who mourn my children and Tammy. Jesus Christ knows the truth of what happened here. Jesus Christ knows that no one was murdered in this case. Accidental deaths happen. Suicides happen. Fatal side effects from medications happen. But then I was told by Jesus that I needed to go back and complete things that I had covenanted or promised to do before I was born. This caused me a lot of distress because I knew heaven was my real home. And I only wanted to be there. I was free from pain, emotional and physical. But then I was shown how I would help my children 
and others in the future. So ultimately, I did agree to go back to my body. Kylie has visited me. She is happy and very busy. Tylee is free now from all the pains of her life. Tylee suffered horrible physical pain her whole life. I sat with Tylee in the hospital year after year after year while she screamed in pain when the morphine wasn't even enough to take away the pain of her pancreatitis. I sat there while she cried and I held back her hair while she threw up. And I am the only person on this earth who knows how much Tylee suffered in her life. She had pain every single day. She never felt good. Her body did not work right. And I don't know if that was from complications from me dying while she was being born or something else, but she had a very difficult life. She was sexually abused by her own biological father since she was three years old. And she was forced by family court to go visit him for 10 years against her will. I fought for her in court. I protected her. I tried to protect her with my whole life. I tried to protect her. I worried about her every single day. Tylee had to get her GED because she couldn't go to school every day because she never felt good. She felt sick. Nobody knows this because Tylee, like myself, tries to put on a good front, tries to be a happy person, tries to have hope in life, tries to know that she's here for a purpose and that she has an eternal purpose to be on this earth. But I never stopped worrying about her. One of the times that Tylee came to me as a spirit after she died, she said, she commanded me and she said to me, stop worrying, mom, we are fine. She knows how I worry and how I miss her. The first time JJ visited me after he passed away, he put his arm around me and he said to me, you didn't do anything wrong, mom. I love you. And I know you loved me every minute of my life. JJ, Joshua Jackson, was an adult spirit. And he was very, very tall when he put his arm around me. He is busy, he is engaged, he has jobs that he does there and he is happy where he is. His life was short, but JJ's life was meaningful. JJ was a wonderful person and touched the lives of everyone. And I adored him every minute of his life. But it was then Judge Stephen Boyce's time to speak to Lori, saying she had no remorse for what she did before handing down three life sentences. And it is the most shocking thing, really, I can imagine, is that a mother killed her own children, and you simply have no remorse for it. Even sitting here today, there's no remorse for what you did. After all of this evidence through trial, you haven't shown any remorse. You haven't said you're sorry. You haven't done anything to seek leniency from this court. There's been a lot of people during trial and here who have explained the devastation you're responsible for, and you've forever altered the lives, not in a good way for many, many people, destroying family relationships, taking people away, the, were loved, cared for, and needed. You may not believe to this day that you've done anything wrong and you still may think you're justified by your religious beliefs for what happened here. I'm not here to judge that, but I don't believe that any God in any religion would want to have have this happen, what happened here. Lori's husband, Chad, is currently awaiting trial for the same charges. 2023 also brought in a handful of not guilty verdicts as we head back to the Sunshine State for the trial of former NFL player Travis Rudolph. State of Florida versus Travis Rudolph. Defendant, verdict. We, the jury, find as follows. As to count one, we find the defendant not guilty. As to count two, we find the defendant 
not guilty. As to count three, we find the defendant. Not guilty. As to count four, we find the defendant. Not guilty. So say we all, the seventh day of June, 2023, in West Palm Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida. Rudolph was found not guilty in June of first degree murder and three counts of attempted murder. The football player was arrested in April 2021 when four men ambushed Rudolph's home after a fight with his former girlfriend, Dominique Jones. During the trial, the ex admitted to texting her brothers to, quote, shoot his sh up because she was angry with Travis. And you testified that he was disrespectful yesterday. That's the moral of the story. Is that correct? Correct. Isn't the moral of the story is that you sent your brother and his friends to go kill Travis? No, the moral of the story is him putting his hands on me. That is really the basis of everything. And, and I didn't send my brothers to kill him. No, you just sent a text to go shoot up his sh right? I, I didn't say shoot him. You sent a text to go shoot up his shit, right? Correct. Let's tell the jury what the shit is. When you're angry, you say things. I'm sure everyone in this courtroom has what said something when you're, I'm trying to speak. If you want me to answer your question, you have to let me answer your question. Well, if you were After the men arrived to Rudolph's home, they all fought. And at one point, Rudolph grabbed a semi-automatic rifle while the men ran for their getaway car. He fired his gun at the group, which killed 21-year-old Sebastian Jean-Jacques and wounded Sebastian's friend, Tyler Robinson. It happened so quickly that as I see, Chris is no longer fighting. I'm, at, at this point, I've realized uh, he's probably going to start shooting at us. So I'm running down the street to get back to the car just to try to uh, uh, just like warn them. I'm trying to get into the car, but um, I'm not sure how many rounds have been fired. But I, I did hear, hear gunshots already as I'm running towards the car. Um, so... I feel myself uh, get shot um, in my back. I'm under the assumption that if I'm getting shot, or so I believe I, I am, and that's what I feel, my brothers are probably getting shot too. So I'm thinking everyone in the car probably died because uh, we're not moving and no one's talking. So I just assumed everyone was dead. Rudolph and his brother both testified they were fighting for their lives that night. Um, the, the fight that was going on, was it one-on-one? -on -one? No. Tell us about that. Um, it was a bunch of back and forth. Sometimes it'd be two-on-one, sometimes it's three-on-one, four-on-one, you know what I'm saying, between me and my brother. How were they fighting with you? Uh, they, was, they was like trying to hurt us really bad, like trying to kill us. I took it as they was trying to kill us. They kicking us, punching us. I got choked one time, everything. Okay. And were they saying anything to you during this uh, during this battle? Yes, they said we on demon time. Y'all gonna die today. Did you start shooting before you saw Tyler with a gun? No. Did you see anyone else with a gun? Yes. Who? Sebastian. And where was his gun? It was pointing through the front windshield. And where was it pointed at? It was pointing in me and my brother's direction. Did you give him a chance to shoot you? No. You know if either one of them took a shot off? No, I don't know. Not to my knowledge well, why why did you shoot first because i mean if, if i wait for them to shoot that's the that's the matter of seconds and it could be me and my brother's life just gone like that did you feel that your brother's life was in danger of uh of being taken away most definitely not only my brother minds as well too any doubt about that in your mind no doubt did you want to shoot anyone no i didn't and it didn't take long for the jury to render their decision. Rudolph was acquitted on all counts after the jury deliberated for less than four hours. And in civil court, one trial played out like a Hollywood movie. Was Gwyneth Paltrow at fault? No. Was Gwyneth Paltrow's fault a cause of Terry Sanderson's harm? Oh, no. There's just no response there. Okay. Was Terry Sanderson at fault? Yes. Was Terry Sanderson's fault a cause Gwyneth Paltrow's did um did Terry Sanderson's fault cause Gwyneth Paltrow's harm? Yes. Comparative fault. What percent of the fault do you assign to Terry Sanderson? 100%. Damages. 
What amount fairly com compensates Gwyneth Paltrow for economic damages? One dollar. Signed March 30th, 2023. A Utah jury awarded actress Gwyneth Paltrow a symbolic dollar bill in her legal battle against optometrist Terry Sanderson. Sanderson sued Paltrow for more than $300,000 over injuries he allegedly sustained when they crashed on a ski slope in 2016. I just remember everything was great and then I heard something I've never heard at a ski resort and that was a blood curdling scream. Just, I can't do it. It was, uh, and then, boom. And it was like somebody was out of control and gonna hit a tree and was gonna die. And that's what I had until I was hit. In addition to losing a day of skiing, Paltrow countersued for a single George Washington plus attorney's fees. And then how did you respond? I said I can still watch my children ski and be skied directly into my back by someone. And then you continued. Which is what happened. Exactly. So you were watching your children when you alleged that you were ski skied directly into your back by someone. My daughter was down the hill. My son was to my left. So I was skiing. My eyes were not fixated only on my son okay. when Mr. Sanderson skied directly into my back. Okay. It was a battle of he said, she said, and the jury sided with Paltrow. As she left the courtroom after the verdict, she told Sanderson that she wished him well, and he reportedly responded, thank you, dear. We end on a medical battle that captivated the nation and was the center of a popular Netflix documentary. Claim one, false imprisonment, October 7th. Through October 13, 2016, Mayan Kowalski. One, did Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital falsely imprison Maya Kowalski without legal authority under circumstances that were unreasonable and unwarranted between October 7th and October 13, 2016? Yes. <laughs> Two, what is the total amount of Maya Kowalski's damages? A Florida jury awarded the Kowalski family more than $260 million in their lawsuit against Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. The hospital was found liable on claims such as false imprisonment, battery, fraudulent billing, and ultimately contributing to the death of Maya's mother, Beata Kowalski. As a child, Maya was diagnosed with a rare neurological condition that was previously treated with ketamine. Once Maya was admitted into Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital in July of 2015, months later, hospital staff reported Maya's mother to the Department of Children and Families after she requested Maya be treated with the drug, saying it helped her in the past. Beata was accused of Munchausen by proxy, and Maya was placed in state custody and remained in the hospital away from her family for months. During that time away from her daughter, Beata committed suicide. During this period of time, do you recall an instance where your mom was trying to get in touch with you and the nurse said something different than just simply putting it through to you? Which instance? Was there a time during this period, this first week or so, mm -hmm. when... Uh, your mom called for you, and you did not receive the call but overheard what was said. Yes, so I remember that my mom was um, on this phone call, and the person who she was speaking to, a person at the hospital, I'm not sure what role they had, but they claimed that I never asked to speak to my mom. I was doing fine. I was okay in my room. I hadn't had any questions about why my parents weren't allowed to see me. And that infuriated me so much because all I did for days on end was demand to speak to my parents. That's all I wanted to do. And I most certainly wasn't just sitting in my room. I was crying. And I <laughs> After the verdict was read, Maya's entire family was visibly emotional as the Kowalskis finally received justice after a years-long battle that tore their family apart.
For all things true crime, Law & Crime Network will keep you updated along the way. From trial hearings to unsealed court documents and everything in between, we have you covered. Reporting for Law & Crime Network, I'm Elizabeth Milner.